problems, worries, sadness. Are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear. Hi, my name is Ralph Martin, and today I'm going to be giving three talks on the spiritual life, the, the stages of the spiritual life, the wisdom that we can learn from the saints, and how we can grow in ever deeper union with the Lord. I think you're going to find the practical wisdom that I'm going to be sharing very helpful. We're talking about the action of the Holy Spirit in our soul. And one of the things we sometimes don't pay attention to enough is that it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God in our soul. And one of the things that the Lord clearly says to us, and this is pretty, pretty radical, I'm still pondering it. He says, be holy for I am holy. That's a command. And if we're going to be related to the holiness of God, we have to, something's got to give. Either we're going to flee from his presence because we don't want to repent from our sin, or we're going to draw closer to be cleansed and so that we can become holy. Becoming holy is a lifelong process. Romans chapter 1. Paul is talking to the Romans and he says, I'm speaking to the beloved of God in Rome, called to be holy. This is, a, this is something that the Lord is very clear about in the Old Testament, but it's also he just keeps repeating it over and over again in the New Testament. First Corinthians, Paul's talking to the Corinthians, and he says, I'm speaking to you who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy with all those everywhere. I think that even includes the ends of the earth. Yes, I think, I think it includes even Tasmania. Yeah. <laughs> Who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. So this is a, a universal call. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, Don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. So you are holy just by virtue of being a Christian. You know what they used to call Christians in the New Testament saints, holy ones. So there's an initial holiness that all of us have been given by the blessing of baptism and, and life in the church. But the Lord says, you got to understand how special you are. You got to understand how sacred you are. You got to understand whose temple you are and how seriously God takes your holiness. Ephesians chapter one, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God had us in mind before he even created the universe. What for? To be holy and without blemish before him in love. There's a profound link between holiness and love, which I'll comment on in a few minutes. So, not only is this a strong, repeated command from the Lord, and not only is this a strong, repeated truth affirmed in so many books of the New Testament, but this is one of the main themes that St. John Paul II says that the Holy Spirit is particularly emphasizing in the church today. I mentioned earlier that when John Paul II wrote his vision statement for the new millennium, for which, which we're in now, 19 years in it, he says that this, I'm going to step back. 
I'm going to ask, what are the main themes the Holy Spirit has been emphasizing in the church today? And the first theme he picked out was the universal call to holiness. He says the Holy Spirit has re reminded us of the universal call to holiness. It's been there all the time, but it hasn't been so emphasized. We really fell into a terrible... The terrible mentality that holiness is for priests and nuns and us lay people are really second-class citizens who we're not really called to be holy like that. And it's okay for us to leave, live a worldly life. It's just not true. So this is some of the things that John Paul II said about the call that the Holy Spirit is giving to us right now. He says, as we enter the new millennium, what's the main thing we need to remember? What's the core of the message that God is giving to us? He says, I would not hesitate to describe it as the contemplation of the face of Jesus. And this reminds me of something that Teresa of Avila said. She said, you know, it's a long journey, but if you just keep your eyes on Jesus, you're going to get there. So it's so important that we keep our eyes on Jesus, not primarily on the problems in the church, not primarily on the ideological disputes, not primarily even on our sins, but on the mercy of Jesus, on the face of Jesus. And as we look at the face of Jesus, we'll be healed, we'll be transformed. We don't have to be looking at our belly button all the time. We need to be looking at Jesus all the time. And then he says, what a treasure there is in the Second Vatican Council. It's prepared the church for the challenges of the third millennium. With the passing of the years, the council documents have lost nothing of their value or brilliance. I feel more than ever in duty bound to point to the council as the great grace bestowed on the church in the 20th century. There we find a sure compass by which to take our bearings in the century now beginning. Just even since I've been here in Australia, but I've been picking it up in other countries also, there's a spiritual battle going on about Vatican II. There are some people who now are saying, uh, the spirit of Vatican II is the important thing. Don't pay so cl close attention to the documents. We need to keep on changing things. But in reaction, people are saying, people are doing that because there's actually flaws in the documents. And certainly there are some things that can be interpreted wrongly in the documents, but St. John Paul II and Benedict have spent 35 years clarifying the correct interpretation. And what I'm concerned about is that the council is going to be a victim. And yet John Paul II is saying, this really is a path forward to genuine renewal. Why do I say that? One of the things the Vatican Council did, did is say we, not, we have to become more familiar with Scripture. You know, to be ignorant of the scripture is to be ignorant of Christ, where we have to know God's word. And that's really, really important. Another thing the council said is that we have to understand the dignity of being lay people. How we'll never be successful in carrying out the mission of the church if we leave it to professional religious. That every single one of us has to take our place in mission. That holiness is important for everybody. That love is important for everybody. And so I would, I would say when... When people out of fear or out of hurt or out of anxiety start attacking Vatican II, that's not the Lord. When people start claiming the spirit of Vatican II and not really referring to the letter, that's not the Lord. So don't be captured by fear. Don't be captured by rebellion. Stay right in the center of God's will for the Catholic Church. So then the Pope goes on to say, I have no hesitation in saying that all pastoral initiatives must be set in relation to holiness. Stressing holiness remains more than ever an urgent pastoral task. Then he talked about the chapter five in the Constitution on the Church where it says that all the Christian faithful of whatever state or rank are called to the fullness of the Christian life and to the perfection of charity. Then, then he says something really interesting. He says, when new people are entering the church, when catechumens are preparing to enter the church, this is what we should ask them. Do you wish to receive baptism? And that means at the same time to ask them, do you wish to become holy? Sometimes when people are entering the church and you ask them why they're entering the church, they say, well, my wife finally convinced me for peace in the family, I should enter the church. Or uh, my best friend says it's really cool, you know, or whatever, you know. And there's probably deeper reasons under the surface, but 
The reason for entering the church is to be transformed, is to become holy. And that's pretty radical. We don't really think about it oftentimes like that, but that's, that's the truth. The church is the place, you know, the church is the place where we are prepared to see the Lord face to face. You know, the Old Testament said nobody can see the Lord and, and live. Remember Moses said, Lord, I'd like, to, I'd like to see you. And Moses said, get behind the rock. I'm going to pass by in my glory, but you're just going to see the, the tail end of my glory. You can't see me and still, still live. Why is that? It's because of our uncleanness, but it's also because of our physical condition our mortality. So there has to be a profound transformation of our spirit or of our soul, but then there also has to be a profound transformation of our mortal body. Mortality has to give way to immortality. Corruption has to give way to incorruption and the resurrection of the dead. So that's where we're heading. We need resurrection from the dead. We need the forgiveness of sins. We need transformation in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then the Pope says, um, the time has come to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living. The whole life of the Christian community and of Christian families must lead in this direction. Then he says, in order for this to be realistic in our life, we have to reconnect with the profound spiritual wisdom of the saints. He says, this tradition has much to say. It shows us how prayer can progress as a genuine dialogue of love, even to the point of rendering the person wholly possessed by the divine beloved. That's something else, isn't it? Wholly under the Lordship of Christ, wholly living in Christ, having put on Jesus Christ, having clothed ourselves with Jesus Christ. And it goes on wholly possessed by the divine beloved and vibrating at the Spirit's touch, being very alert to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, being very alert to wisdom that God wants to give us, being very alert to warnings that God wants to give us, saying this is not the right direction, this is, this is not right what's being said now, being very alert to inspirations to call up somebody on the phone and invite them to somewhere just that kind of sensitivity to the Spirit of God dwelling in our soul. Then finally, he says, resting filially within the Father's heart. So the post basically saying, he's talking about deep Trinitarian union, resting on the heart of the Father, peace, security, trust, love, attentive to the stirrings of the Spirit, totally under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Then the Pope says, this is not just for us individuals. This is for us as a people, as a community. He talks about how the parishes of the new millennium need to provide training in holiness. You don't just become holy by being exhorted to holiness. You have to be taught things, and hopefully we'll be doing that here. Then he also says our Christian communities must become genuine schools of prayer where the meeting with Christ is expressed not just in imploring help, but also in thanksgiving, praise, adoration, contemplation, listening, and ardent devotion until the heart truly falls in love. That's quite a job description for a Catholic parish, isn't it? a place where people experience the presence of the Lord, where they learn to pass from just asking for things that they need to thanking God for the blessings that they're surrounded with and praising him for his glory, silent prayer, contemplation. I'm not sure if I'm reading Mother right or not, but she's a little worried about how you're taking this. They're taking it good. They're taking notes. They're paying attention. Yeah, okay, right? Yes, okay. And then he begins by, ends by saying, it would be wrong to think that ordinary Christians can be content with a shallow prayer that is unable to fill their whole life. With that as an introduction, 
Let's ask ourselves what is a good definition of holiness. When we hear the word holy, different pictures come into our mind, like maybe holy cards, holy mass, candles, incense, rosaries. And all those things have a significant relationship to holiness, but they don't really tell us what the essence is. Jesus tells us what the essence is. He says what this is all about is loving God with your whole mind, your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So what it means to grow in holiness is grow in love. And it's a lot harder to grow in love than to say an extra rosary, isn't it? Saying extra rosaries are good, good to say extra rosaries, but that's not really what it's all about. What it's all about is allowing our hearts to be transformed into more and more hearts of love. <coughs> Therese of Lisieux gives another definition of holiness. So this is what she says. Holiness consists in doing his will, in being what he wills us to be, who resist his grace in nothing. You know, sometimes we think that holiness is a burden that God is placing on us, like, oh, gee, I got to be holy, darn it. You know, can I still drink beer? You know, can I, can I still go shopping? Can I still have fun with my friends? You know, can I still root for my favorite football team? Can I still put on makeup? We kind of think that, you know, holiness is about giving up things. Holiness is about is reordering our priorities. The Lord doesn't want to take away any good thing that he's given us. He wants it in the proper order in our life. Holiness isn't a burden that God's placing on us. It's a blessing he's trying to give us. He's trying to bring us into our true self. That's why Therese's definition is so, so helpful. It's being whom God created us to be. It's saying yes to our truest identity. It's saying yes to our deepest self. It's saying, yes, Lord, I want the wounds of sin. I want the, the confusion in my mind. I want the disorder in my passions to be ordered so that I can experience the freedom, the joy, the love, the confidence, the identity that you really want me to have. So saying yes to holiness is saying yes to our happiness. Teresa's, Teresa of Avila gives another definition of holiness. She says what it means to be holy is to be our will to be one with God's will, to love what God loves, to hate what God hates, to desire what God desires. So what, what does God hate? Did you ever think about God hating stuff? He does. You know what he hates? He hates sin. He hates what blocks his people from the happiness that he created them for. He hates those things that darken our mind and weaken our will and destroy our bodies and minds and souls. He hates those things that block us from the happiness that he has in store for us and why he created us. This is pretty radical too. The only reason why God created each one of you is to be a saint. And the only way you will ever be happy is to be a saint. I know it sounds crazy, but it's the truth. Do you know that the only people who are in heaven right now are saints? I'm not just talking about these heroes on the side here. I'm talking about anybody who's there has totally surrendered the evil in their life and totally surrendered to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. There's another scripture text that says, uh, holiness is not an option. Hebrews chapter 12, I think verse 14, it says, strive for that holiness without which nobody will see the Lord. Strive, the same word we saw in Luke 13 about strive to enter by the narrow door. Strive for holiness without which nobody will see the Lord. So there's a big cloud of kind of a lukewarmness over the Catholic Church today, and I think we've all been affected by it. You know, one of the things that the founder of the Curcio movement, that was the retreat I made that really saved my soul, he said that one of the things the Catholic Church is most suffering from today is what he called a minimalist corruption of the gospel. Asking from people less than Jesus is actually asking. Sort of editing Jesus, softening Jesus. 
and offering to people less than Jesus is offering. The power of the Holy Spirit, discipleship, intimate relationship, friendship. So we've got to cast off the lukewarmness. Well, something else that Jesus says about lukewarmness is pretty shocking. Revelations chapter 3, I think it says, would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I vomit you out of my mouth. Ooh. I said, this couldn't possibly mean what it, what it sounds like. So I looked at commentary and it says, lukewarmness makes Jesus sick. Yeah, I kind of thought that was what it was saying, you know. <laughs> Trust your instinct, you know, a lot of it's pretty clear, you know. Now, this isn't meant to condemn us. This is meant to shock us awake. This is meant to pull us out of our lukewarmness. This is meant to dispel the deception that's in our minds. No matter how worldly you think you are, no matter how much you feel like you love food so much or sex so much or shopping so much or music so much or sports so much, no matter how worldly and planted on the earth you think you are, the truth about you is that you were created for one purpose, to be one with God. So we gotta, we gotta begin the journey. We gotta start on the path. We gotta continue on the path. And we'll see what the Lord does to bring, put our loves in order. I'm gonna talk about some of the things that maybe are going through our mind and heart or maybe have gone through our mind and heart when we hear about the call to holiness. Oftentimes when we hear about the call to holiness, we respond something like this. I know I'm called to holiness, but. <laughs> Anybody got any butts hanging around there? I'm gonna to try to identify some of the butts and remove them. So all we're left with is an unconditional yes. Trusting not on our own strength, but trusting that the God who has called us to holiness is more than capable to bringing us from wherever we're coming from, step by step on the journey. So what's one of the most common buts? I know I'm called to holiness, but hey, I'm just a lay person. You know, I've got so much stuff going on in my life. I've got final exams coming up at school. I, 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 I hope I can get a good job, you know. Uh, I'd sure like to get married, but there's no prospects right now. Or, you know, just all the things that go through our minds and hearts, you know, or gee, I'm overweight or I'm underweight or, you know, I'm not fit or, you know, golly, what's wrong with me? You know, I've got social handicaps. You know, I've got so much going on. I've got, I've got debts. I've got loans. You know, I've got, you know, I've got problems in my family. Uh, there's just so much going on in our life. We sometimes think that, I know I'm called to holiness, but there's so much stuff going on right now. Uh, I'm just a lay person. It's, it's those nuns, you know, they, they pray two hours a day. How could I ever possibly do that, you know? And, you know, Brother Maximilian, you know, you know, I mean, you know, these wonderful priests, you know, like we just kind of feel like we're in a different ballpark. We're in a different ballpark, but you know what? We're called to the same thing and we need to find a path according to our circumstances. So just a lay person, huh? You mean just somebody created in the image of God, you know? Is that, that, all, you, is that all you are? Oh, sorry to hear that. What a lowly state somebody created in the image of God. A baptized lay person? How many here are baptized lay people? Whoa. The Holy Trinity is dwelling in you. You are the temple of God. And if anybody destroys you, he's going to be destroyed by the Lord because you are holy. Yes, you're already starting off at a good place, really good place. So no more this, I'm just a lay person, okay? Say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lay person created in the image of God. I'm a lay person whom the Holy Trinity is dwelling. I'm a lay person who's called to holiness and he's able to do it and I trust that he will do it. Now, at the same time, we feel like, uh, here's another thing. I know I'm called to holiness, but later. Anybody got any later there, you know? You know? After I graduate, you know, after my career is established, after I get married, uh, after I go through this health crisis, uh, after my parents reconcile, after I move out of the house, after I move into the house, you know, whatever, you know, uh, 
we kind of feel like there's going to be some better time in the future that we'll be able to give ourselves more fully to the spiritual journey. That's not true. There is no better time in the future. What Father Chris shared this morning in the homily is that the real tactic that, that Wormwood proposed that his uncle, you know, approved was there's plenty of time later. People spend their whole lives in wishful thinking that someday they're actually going to do what they know they're supposed to do and they never do it. Don't be. Don't be that way. That's why the scripture says, if you hear his voice today, harden not your hearts. You're going to hear his word today. It may not even be through anything I'm saying. Maybe something that just comes into your mind or something that somebody else says in your sharing group. You're going to hear his word today. If you hear his word today, don't be like that foolish person that looks in the mirror and forgets what they've seen. The book of James talks about. Take what the Lord gives you. Maybe the Holy Spirit will convict you of a deception that was in your mind that he's going to give you the grace to renounce and replace it with truth. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Also, None of us know how many more days of life we have. Life is short. One of the Psalms says, meditate on the shortness of life and learn wisdom of heart. People of all different ages are appearing before the judgment seat of God every single day. Young people, middle-aged people, older people. We don't know how much time we have, so make use of the time you have. You don't know how much more time you have. Now's the time to love. Now's the time to sacrifice. Now's the time to seek God. There's a verse in the prophet Jeremiah that says, Seek the Lord while he still may be found. Seek the Lord while he still may be found for you. There's one more kind of deception that sometimes we fall into. As great as these saints are that we're surrounded by here, sometimes when we read a life of the saint, we're inspired, but we're also discouraged. Wow, St. Simon the Stylite spent 20 years living on a pillar in the Egyptian desert. Hmm, impressive, but I don't feel called to that. Or Catherine of Siena hardly ate anything for the last three years of her life. Or some of these saints did severe penances and things like that. So we read the lives of the saints and sometimes we're encouraged, but we're also discouraged because we don't feel like we have that. St. Therese had the same, same experience. She said, I'd really like to be a great saint, but when I look at these great saints, I don't think I've got what it takes. She says, I see the steps I need to take in the spiritual life, and I don't think I've got it. I'm not attracted towards these great penances. And then she says, I wonder if there's a shortcut for people like me. So what happens is we say, you know, I'm inspired, but I think by the time I die, I'm not going to be ready to see the Lord face to face. So I guess what I'm going to do is aim for purgatory. Now, there's a couple problems with aiming for purgatory. One is that nowhere in the Catholic Bible does Jesus ever say, oh, by the way, guys, aim for purgatory. <laughs> he doesn't say that, does he? He says, be perfect because your heavenly Father is perfect. Be, be fully whom God created you to be. Say yes to the whole plan of God for your life. But there's also a bigger problem. Not only is it something that Jesus doesn't say, but uh, we don't always hit the targets we aim for. And if we're aiming for heaven, but by the time we die, there's still purification needed. Praise the Lord for purgatory. We're in, we're saved, we should celebrate. Yes, there may be some painful purification that needs to happen, but hey, we're saved, we've made it. But what happens if we're aiming for purgatory and miss? What do you think? Not, 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 a good, not a good thing. I hear it's hell to miss purgatory. Shoot for heaven. Strive for their holiness without which nobody can see God. Let's talk about what our spiritual tradition says about the stages of spiritual growth. The wisdom of our tradition recognizes that in most cases we're talking about a long journey. There's a, a traditional division of the stages of spiritual growth called purgative, illuminative, and unitive. Those are kind of fancy words, and they have some meaning, and I'll explain what they are. 
but you can think about it as the beginning, the middle, and the end. So what's the purgative? The purgative is the initial purification that comes after conversion, the initial turning away from sin, the initial kind of getting our passions in order, the initial kind of conforming ourselves to the Ten Commandments. And that can take a long while, as we know. It's where we're being purified of, of things that are serious in our life, serious sin. The illuminative is the place where we're growing in understanding, where we're growing in virtue, we're growing in peace, we're, we're growing in harmony with God's will, we're growing in prayer. The unitive is when we've come into that Trinitarian union that John Paul II describes that we're all called to, where we're really living under the Lordship of Christ. We're really living in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. We're really living in peace and confidence on the Father's heart. And that we're, our loves have been put in order. And there's all kinds of other tremendous fruit that comes. Tremendous apostolic fruitfulness comes the deeper our union with the Lord. In fact, in chapter 8 of John Paul II's missionary encyclical, Mission of the Redeemer, he talks about missionary spirituality. He talks about the profound link between union with God and fruitfulness in mission. It makes sense. It's logical, and it's just verified by experience also. Now, each of these doctors of the church describes the journey, sometimes using different words, like, for example, Teresa of Avila describes the stages of the spiritual journey, talking about seven mansions or seven stages, seven interior mansions, and going from mansion one to mansion seven. So just to give you a little feel, um, you know, again, John of the Cross uses the purgative, illuminative, and unitive, but then he also uses some other words like active and passive nights of uh, senses and spirit. And so what I've done in, in this book here is I've kind of did a little chart kind of to kind of see how the language that one saint uses kind of refers to uh, another saint in different stages of the spiritual life. So it's kind of a little guide to the different vocabulary and terminology that the different doctors of the church use and how they're all talking about the same thing and sometimes using different language, sometimes using the same language. So let's just quickly, before we end today, go through uh, a little quick tour of Teresa's seven mansions. This takes a lifetime to get through, but we'll get through here in five or 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> Mansion number one, we turn away from sin. We, we renounce demonic influence in our life. We try to have sincere repentance and deliverance from the things that are holding us in bondage. Mansion number two, we may still be falling we may have not overcome carelessness in avoiding the near occasions of sin. We encounter our first test of dryness. The, 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 the feelings that may have experienced conversion may have died down. We may not experience the love of God like we used to. We, we may wonder if it's all real. We, we may think it's too hard and think about turning back. And this is where this is where the first hard decisions have to be made about, even though I'm not experiencing the love I first felt, I know the call is real, I know God is real, and I just have to keep going no matter what. So that's the kind of first kind of tough decision that we have to make. And we have to understand the truth between faith and feelings. Feelings come and go, but God has given us faith, which is a sure knowledge of the truth and a sure knowledge of the path. And uh, Mansion two, we're still kind of worldly. We're, we still got our kind of headphones on and we're still listening to secular music and we're still listening to stupid news all the time and we're still thinking that the things that the world are concerned about are really important things, you know. We're, we're still filling our mind with the world. Mansion number three, we're making some progress. We're growing in confidence in, in the Lord's kind of commitment to us. We're growing in stability in the practices of the Catholic life. We're somewhat more regularly praying, we're, we're going to mass regularly, we're uh, not falling into serious sin like we used to. We're also growing in humility, recognizing that this is a tough journey. We can't do it by our own strength, but we need to be dependent on God. Now, what's really interesting, the very last chapter in the book, 
has a quote from each of the major doctors of the church saying, anybody can make it to the unitive way if you want it. Teresa of Avila says, there's no reason why somebody makes it to stage three, why they can't go all the way to stage seven if they want to. And she says what mainly holds people back, what mainly they get stuck in like good Catholic life, but they just kind of stay there. They don't progress in a deeper union, a deeper receptivity to the Holy Spirit and things like that. The reason why they don't is because of lack of knowledge or lack of desire. So that's why the knowledge that we're going to be sharing during these days is important. Knowing what you're called to, knowing what some of the obstacles are and deceptions that hold us back, and knowing what some of the solutions are that the saints give us. Lack of desire. Now, Teresa will say things like this. She'll say, unless you have a very great desire for God, you're not going to make much progress, unless you're hungry for God. But then she says, if you don't have a very great desire for God, ask God to give it to you, and he will. I, I don't know what the system here is in Australia, but in the United States, if you fall below a certain economic level, poverty level, you qualify for state aid, you know, state assistance. So when you're on the spiritual journey, if you fall below the poverty level and you don't have what you need, ask God for what you need and he'll give it to you. You'll qualify for divine welfare. It's really cool. Every time you run into your own poverty, guess what? You just qualified for a handout from God. She also says things like this. Unless you have very great determination, you're not going to make much progress. She says the same thing. Ask God to give you that determination. Never think that when you run into what you think is the definitive roadblock in your life and you can't go any further on a spiritual journey that that's the truth. It's not the truth. You've run into that roadblock to bring you to a point of even greater dependence on God, greater humility, greater turning to him, greater relying on him. Yes, it's humiliating. Say, Lord, I can't, I can't go any further. I, I, I'm, I'm missing something here. But that's where you asking God to have mercy on you and give you what's missing, and he will. But you need to persist. Mansion four. This is where prayer becomes a little deeper, where we start experiencing some recollection in prayer. Uh, a quietness comes into our soul. We may experience something that she describes as the prayer of quiet. What she describes as the prayer of quiet is a sense of our will being united to God's will, even though our memory and imagination are going every which way. So we can be in prayer and our memory and imagination is wandering all over, but there's a way in which our will is being connected to God's will. And then she says we begin to focus on love, on obedience, uh, and, and we kind of grow in prayer, grow in love, grow in obedience. Mansion 5 she says, is characterized by the prayer of union. What she means by the prayer of union is not only is our will united with God's will, but our memory and our imagination are captured by the Lord also. It's like we're all focused on him. All the faculties of our soul have been captured by the Lord. Now she says, this isn't a state that lasts very long. She said the first time she experienced it, it lasted like the length of a Hail Mary. She said the longest she ever experienced was about a half hour. And she says the most significant thing is not the experience of the prayer of union, but the deepening union of our will with God's will. She even says that a lot of people reach this state of union, Mansion 5, without any of these special experiences. She says, weak people need experiences, and that's why she's getting them. Mansion 6. This is where what she talks about as the spiritual betrothal takes place. It's like the Lord saying, you're on the path, you're making progress, you, you, you're going to get there, and I'm going to give you a pledge of what they call the spiritual marriage, which comes in Mansion 7. But in order to get ready for the spiritual betrothal, kind of like the pace picks up a bit, both the pace of special graces that God may give us. This is where Teresa goes through all the special phenomena that can happen, doesn't have to happen. 
But it's also where the purifications, trials, and temptations pick up. This is where uh, deep aridity and prayer may be experienced, the dark night that John talks about of the, of the spirit, of the soul. Uh, this is where uh, temptations to faith may come. And there's wonderful, wonderful wisdom about this that we'll hopefully get, to, we, we will get to it uh, before these talks are over. Um, Teresa of Avila was in the state of spiritual betrothal, maybe, uh, she was in Mansion 6, maybe for 10 years, something like that, and then another 12 years, you know, before she died in spiritual marriage, so, something like that. So this, these kind of stages can take years. Mansion number seven, spiritual marriage, it's sort of like where there's the definitive defeat of what was troubling the soul. There's a profound peace that can't be shaken. She says there still can be like a storm on the surface of the ocean, but underneath the ocean, things are absolutely still. She says there still can be conflict, there still can be suffering, but uh, there's just a profound peace in the depths of our soul. There's a almost constant jubilation. There's the experience of a habitual embrace by the Lord. We know we're being held by him. We know we're in him. Uh, there's a tremendous apostolic fruitfulness. Uh, it's just all kinds of tremendously wonderful things. So it's really worthwhile going through the purification because of what lies on the other side of it. Right now, the point I'd like you to take from this is that the Catholic life isn't static. It isn't getting hatched, matched, and dispatched. <laughs> it isn't getting baptized, married, and buried. It's not flat. There's a depth to it. There's a whole world to it. There's a whole life to it. So one of the things I'd like to suggest is that you take off any ceilings that you've placed on what you think God can do with you. Take off any limitations that you've placed on yourself because of your experience of your weaknesses. And cast yourself on the mercy of God. And tell the Lord you want to go all the way. It's a long journey. You'll get discouraged at times. You'll be tempted to give up at times. You'll wonder if it can really happen for you at times, but it can and it will. It's not so important that we know exactly what stage we're in. What's important we know is that there are stages, that there's more that there's more that the Lord has for us and that we really want that more. Okay, praise the Lord. I think the mission school was an amazing experience. I have came to meet with a lot of nice young Catholics and as well as I discovered myself that there are a lot of lacking in my life that I need to work on. And I think it's uh, good for mind, body and soul in every angle. And I'm amazed that Mother Superior, uh, she has organized this and this is, this is what we need at this point of time. And then praise and worship also uh, that they have done here. I think it was a good experience for me. I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Shalom World brings to you the Catholic faith. In all its different dimensions, it can be a faith to inspire you in, in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Salon World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you, you're involved to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.